a londoni startupok nem csak az itt élők életét könnyítik meg, hanem a város arculatára is hatással vannak. Jövőre például ezen a ponton kezdik el építeni a Garden Bridge-et, azaz azt a hidat, amely mintegy 2500 négyzetméter kertet foglal magába. Itt vagyunk a híres inkubátorház az Ideal London előtt, melyet a University College London, a Cisco és a DC Thomson működtet. This is a startup space. So Cisco bring in all of their clients and customers so that they can meet the startups. And DC Thomson are investors, so they've invested in a couple of the businesses here. Ambiex started, um, it was a spin out from Philips and they actually left Philips about seven years ago. I personally have only been involved with them for just over a year. It's possible to see that actually they're a classic startup in the sense that they have started and failed and started and failed in several businesses before they actually got to where we are now, although in actual fact they stayed in business through that time. Um, so it really span out with some really smart technology, but it was a solution in search of a problem. The solution that we provide the problem to is control of network lighting and um, connected lighting so so you can see that they could easily be powered using an ethernet cable mm -hmm. and ethernet switches so the lighting becomes part of the building network the IT network rather uh -huh. than the power network well actually what you do with it is you use it to create your perfect environment or what you, you create your intention as being your perfect environment for a meeting room like this for example the hardest thing is um, for me coming this this was a new venture for me. I've never worked in a startup before. I've never um, had the highs and the lows mm. <laughs> in such clo close yeah, proximity, yeah, yeah. almost on a daily basis. It kind of goes like this and, and kind of getting used to that is, is probably the hardest thing. So, I mean, it doesn't really look like anything special, but we have a top. And then I've, I'm wearing the leggings at the moment. <laughs> so when I was at the University of Reading, I was researching the photobiological effects of infrared light. And I was studying this using horses. And it came to me at the time that the benefits that I was seeing with the animals could be great benefits to humans as well. So I started Chimera Sports with the intention of taking the infrared technology we've developed to, into a medical market, but starting off on the sportswear market to validate the technology. If you can imagine a hollow polyester fibre, in the centre of that we embed 13 specially selected minerals. And those minerals absorb body heat and light and heat energy in the surroundings, and they convert that into infrared. The infrared is then re-emitted, and it causes a number of biological reactions within the wearer that enhance performance and accelerate recovery. The infrared light causes a number of biological reactions. They vary from an increase in circulation, increased tissue oxygen levels, there's a pain relief response, and also your cells actually grow, repair, and replicate quicker when exposed to this infrared light. I had a thought and thought, well, why can't we create electricity from this? So that's our current project, is we're turning this wasted energy into electricity. The smart garment will be powered by the wearer's wasted energy, and it will have embedded biomedical sensors so that it can detect emergencies happening, such as a heart attack. It will detect the heart attack occurring, connect to a third-party device, such as a mobile phone, and then contact the emergency services with a diagnosis and a location, reducing response time and saving their life. Nowadays, we see the widest range in the number of businesses that are, yes, they're using technology and they've got a strong web presence and a strong social presence, but actually they're doing something more offline, it's a retail store, it's the weird, more hybrids. And many of our investors really embrace that. They don't want just a pure tech play or they don't necessarily want just a pure brick and mortar play. Uh, they want businesses that are solving interesting problems um, with, with effective solutions and using technology well, even if they're not kind of a pure tech business. So that's something that we're seeing and I think is very, very, very exciting. We've got a, one that's focusing on dementia care and helping with a reminiscent app. So it's an app on an iPad that uh, people who have dementia can go onto and with their carer and they can look through images that might help them remember their past and tell stories mm -hmm. about what was happening. 
We provide a web-based platform that helps reduce energy and resource consumption and cost in the built environment. Imagine your big commercial building as a puzzle with different pieces. The stakeholders, the landlord, the tenant, the different sources, energy, electricity, water waste and so on. So you have all these puzzle pieces which you need to put together in order to really understand how your building operates. How much can you save with Energy Deck? Um, depends, is always the answer. It works for homes as well. Um, and you can, you can set it up yourself and start using it straight away. There's one caveat with it, is that most homes don't have automatic meters or smart meters available today. So you can use it, uh, it works, but you have to enter the data manually. A lot of people don't do that or wouldn't do that. I've got a 200 pound watch on my wrist that's more powerful than, than the building management system that's running this building and most other buildings in, in London. Right? Um, and I've got it here, and you could you could do an, an sen a sensor for the home that measures electricity for 20 pounds, very easy, even less than that, right? mm -hmm. and connected to the internet. It's all easy stuff that's super commoditized. It hasn't really made it into the market yet at, at scale, but it's going to come in the next two or three, one, two, three, four years. R working at Google is not dissimilar in some ways to working in a startup. They work with you over the years. They almost set you up for doing just that when when you leave. So the, so, the, so the saying goes, when you leave Google, you either join a startup or you start a startup. And there's not very many things in, in between. And some people might go to Facebook or so on, but that's getting very old now as well. It's one of the older. <laughs> it's not a startup anymore. If you work on a startup, by definition, you, you, make, you make your own path, your own experiences, and you don't know what's going to happen. There's no really best practices. There's lots of tools, helpful advice, mentoring, as we've seen earlier, which all of which help. Um, but you still have to go through your fair share of failures to figure things out. London's a great place to, to, to build a startup, um, and, and, and I think there are a few reasons. I mean, one is that it is one of the most connected cities in the world. Uh, the English language certainly helps, um, it, it, but you know, the fact is that unlike in America, where people build businesses just for America, Britain's not quite big enough to just think about a British business if you're trying to build something great. So London is a wonderful jumping off point to build something, to get some traction, but then to go to Europe, to go to America, to go to Asia, to Africa and elsewhere. And the connectivity is just fantastic, both in terms of sort of, you know, flights and technical connectivity, but also in terms of relationships and cultural overlap.